Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, episode 476, Traveling Through Connecticut. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, but especially all the people who play them. On today's show, we are in Connecticut. Well, I mean, I'm always in Connecticut, but Tom, Sam, and Z are in Connecticut as well for a special event at the Portal in Manchester, Connecticut. You'll hear wits and wagers, some questions from the audience, games we have played throughout the course of the event, and a few surprises as well. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Lorelei to my Rory, Tom Vassell. Huh. I don't know that reference, Eric. I had to look it up. <laughs> hey, folks, this is a very different podcast than we normally do. You Actually, this is kind of a little like what we've done before. I mean, this is back when we would do uh, an intro of a podcast over breakfast or, um, you know, just yeah, finding a hole in the wall somewhere. It's been a long time since we've done one of these. We, we didn't want to do necessarily a live podcast, although you're going to hear some stuff that we did live. We're at the uh, Portal Game Store. We're in it right now recording. Um, and we can't, they brought us up for an event that they're running over the weekend. That's essentially, we love the Dice Tower. <laughs> kind of. We've been playing games with, with all sorts of folks. And uh, there, have been, there was a Thursday evening sort of meet and greet and play session. And we stayed until like 1 a.m. playing games. And then all day yesterday. And we stayed until uh, midnight. We are getting ready on Saturday here. We're all going to play our, our quote-unquote favorite games. Tom, you're playing Cosmic Encounter. No, I believe we are playing our favorite games. Our, so has that shifted for Sam? Sam's playing Blood Rage. Sam's keeping that really close to the chest. Is he? But <laughs> Oh, because he's doing his ranking But Z soon. keeps asking him straight up, and, <laughs> and I think it's his favorite game. Okay. I think it's past Twilight. Awesome. Uh, so that's today, and then you guys have to leave and, and head back to the real world, or kind as a, real as it is for you guys. That's right. We still go back to gaming. Yes. Now we got a lot of stuff to do. So uh, we had a chance to play a lot of games here. Um, the game of the con for me is one I haven't actually even played. It's just I've been teaching it because I brought it with me, and that's a Feast for Odin. Yes. And that I me as well, yeah. Right. I mentioned this in a previous show. Feast for Odin is the new Big Uwe Rosenberg. It has elements of patchwork where you're covering up a... You've a got a grid. grid, yeah. And honestly, that's pretty much the main focus of your game is covering up that grid mm-hmm. and possibly other grids. And you're doing that by placing workers on 60 different spots. Yeah. There's a huge amount of options in this game. What did you think? I, I, I enjoyed it. I really did. It's it's one of those that's overwhelming. The word I've been using a lot is dizzying because that array of action selections, 60 of them is crazy. Right. And, and for AP players... On a first look, it's going to be daunting, I think. Um, but the mechanism of how those actions are, are doled out, they're in four columns. And so you've got one column that you put a single worker on, another column you put two workers on, three, and then four. Right. And the more powerful actions require more of your workers. At first, those four-person actions are, I've only got six of these guys, but you get more workers each right, round. I want you up to 12 guys, that's okay. Yeah, I could do that. And um, and they're very, very useful. Uh, eventually, you start to figure out, what do I want to do? In fact, that should be the question. What do I want to do with my board? And then figure out how I'm going to do it, um, rather than looking at all of your options. If you look at every single option, I think you're going to freeze. Um, but I liked it. I, I think it's it's rewarding. It's one that multiple plays are certainly going to allow you to do more things. As you become more efficient, you can start bringing on a new island that, that hopefully will uh, you know give you more points and not lose you points. It it's got a lot going on, and and it's I think it's it's very very cool. I've actually considered making a how to play it video because after having taught it several times here, I really feel like it's a game that needs to be taught. You've got the patter down, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I could handle doing this by the rule book. Well, the rule book is not the best rule book. It does explain how to play the game, but like the, with the sixty action spaces, mm-hmm. it kind of says, "Well, this group works this way," and it picks one of the middle groups. Yeah, and it's like, "And this group does this," and I'm like, "Why aren't you listing each?" spot. Yes. Just tell me exactly what each spot does. Now, they're really not that complex, but there's a few concepts that take some getting used to, like the hunting and the, and the yeah. whaling and things like that. That's not a common concept. At first, you see a die and you're like, randomness. <laughs> and it is randomness, but it's not 
It's, it's weird randomness. It's like, if you succeed, you get a great reward. If you fail, well, you fail, but you get some you get something, yeah. stuff that you can use the next time you try. Right. And it, it's not hard to fail, to succeed, because you can re-roll the die three times. Yeah. So There's a little bit of a push your luck. Uh, you know, the, the better roll you get, the fewer resources you have to spend. So you may be able to succeed, but if you roll again, you may pay less. Um, but you might also really mess up and roll a high number when you don't want one. It's right. It's neat. I also had a chance to play a little card game called Stealing Mona Lisa. Ah. This is a, essentially, I am trying to um, outwit my opponents by, first you draft a bunch of cards. These cards are in different suits. I think there's four or five suits, numbered yeah. up to seven. Everyone drafts five cards. Then you turn over a bunch of paintings. Everyone says which painting they're going to steal secretly. You, and if you're the only person, to, and you also put down some cards to steal that painting, each painting needs some requirements. It might need strength or hacking or whatever. And you put down cards that equal the, the skills for that. If you're the only person to steal a painting, you discard those cards. Hmm. Don't show anyone what they are and say, I had the skills, I need it. All right, but if you go to a painting that someone else has gone to, then you both flip your cards. And if... if as long as you are legitimately allowed to steal that painting, you're still in the mix. And if you are in the mix, then you add your numbers again, and whoever has the highest number wins the painting. Okay. It's okay. It sounds more fun than it is. Okay. Because that drafting phase, you simply just keep the highest cards. The difference between mm. getting a seven strength and a one strength is huge. Sure. Right? Yeah. And so when you look at the paintings that you can steal from, you're like, oh, I'm definitely, there's one less than the number of players. So the chance of you getting one and stealing it without no one else getting it, it Pretty, can happen. Yeah, yeah. Right? And it has happened. I stole Mona Lisa, which I think now I've accomplished the goal of the game. I think so. You've won it. I'm done. Um, but just then when it's like, oh, okay, now we're going to see who actually won the painting when you compete, you flip the cards over and, oh, well, I have a higher total. Mm -hmm. That was pretty easy. I liked it okay, but the graphic design is awful. It feels like they use clip art and famous paintings. Ugh. So just not the best for me. Yeah. So that is Stealing Mona Lisa. I got to play um, Arcane Academy last night. It was one of the last games I played in the evening, and so I was already starting to get a little foggy. But um, I remember you enjoying this one. It's a pretty straightforward game. Yeah, it, you've got a, like a grid with a bunch of action spaces, and you can spend some of those actions to put more tiles onto this, this grid. Um, and there's this mechanism where you activate one of them, and if you've connected those tiles to other tiles, you can also get bonus actions. And so part of the game is building this grid right. so that you can most efficiently do stuff. And I, I think I was expecting the game to last longer than it was, and so I... No, it's a short game, really. It's a short game, and so I was sort of building for the long term, and I'll build here, and then a couple of turns later, I'll build over here. Meanwhile, the guy next to me is grabbing one tile with four connections. He slaps it right in the middle of his board, and then he just keeps building stuff, and then he goes, boom, five things. Boom, four things. And he won, <laughs> because it's a race right. to build eight magical items, um, and that ends the game, and you're probably going to win if you if you pushed it to that point. Um, yeah. I don't, it was okay. I, I don't think I was blown away by it, and that may have been my That's surprising. Foggyness. I figured this would be more up your alley. Maybe I. It, it may have been my expectations of it lasting a little bit longer than it did. So right. I didn't. I, I felt like I was building an engine that I never got to fire. Um, so I, I just need to try it again with more, more knowledge of the fact that it could go a lot faster than that and be more efficient in my building. I just got smoked, really. So but that's arcane so academy. Essentially, you're, you're learning that Eric, if he loses. Yeah, I get I get soured pretty easily. I uh, played Automania again, which is oh. a game I really enjoy still. That just buying, making, and selling cars. Uh, again, I like the concept of the game because it just you can sell a car in turn one. Mm -hmm. You can just jump right in and do things, and it plays so smoothly. I taught three new people. I won, which made me feel kind of like because eh, I hate teaching a game to new people and winning. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I only won by one point, so I feel like that was okay, okay right? Yeah, yeah. It's one thing you come in you're like, all right, guys, let's play. <laughs> Did you have fun? And that's one of the reasons I'm not playing Feast for Odin with everybody. I think okay. teaching it because I feel you really confident do need I would to, win. Yeah, if you're if you're the one person that's played before, you're probably going to destroy everyone. Right, because you also, well, especially if you play multiple times, you're like, oh, this is a good decision to make here. So yeah. anyway, Automedia is still a lot of fun. Still not very widespread in America yet. Hmm. Um, I'm hoping that we see more of it. Hmm. 
Uh, one more to, for me to talk about, I guess, is uh, a, a, an odd trick-taking card game called Take the A Train. This is from Sashi and Sashi, the Japanese design right. team that did Coffee Roaster. It's got a it's got a jazz theme, so a musical theme. Uh, you've got a deck of cards with um, four suits. That what is are, a trick-taking jazz game? It's a trick-taking jazz game. Uh, five suits, I think. Uh, different colors that are different moods of music. And then you've got the letters A through G representing different keys that you can be playing. And at any given moment, you've got this circular track, and one key is going to be the lead key, the main key, the best key. And that will usually take the trick. Um, and then everything else goes around the circle and progressively worse as you go through the letters. You're going to play, somebody leads a card, and you have to follow suit if you can, but you could also break that rule if you play the same key that somebody else played already, the same letter. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and if you do that, that you like actually... Uno almost, an Uno trick-taking It's game. a little bit like Uno. Um, and then if somebody does that, they change the key for the next hand. So if I play a B and you play a B, then on the next turn, even if G was the lead key, it's now going to be B for the next Is this hand. hard to keep track of? It, it's not hard to follow what's going on, but it's a little counterintuitive about what's going to win because it's the letter you're worried about, not necessarily the color or whether you followed suit. Um, if you legally play uh, just a random card that's higher ranked than the lead card, you're going to win that trick. Um, and there's also a sort of a, a hill scoring. So if you win one trick, two tricks, three tricks is the best. You get like 30 points. But then it starts to go back down again. And if you win almost all of the tricks, you lose 40 points. Um, okay. There's also... This uh, is almost too wonky, I think. I mean, I probably would enjoy it, but I would, when you have this wonky, I think a lot of people aren't going to like it. I think, yeah, that's, that's where I'm feeling. It's odd. And... Is odd a good idea for a trick-taking card game? I think it almost pushes it too far. I like the control. I like being able to change the key. You can even, um, if you play the same key as the lead player and you're the last player, you enter improvisation mode. It's kind of like war. You flip over the, the last hand, do it again, and now it, the stakes have been r risen. They, they, you, uh, right. You're now playing for two tricks instead of one. Um, that's kind of cool. Uh, and just manipulating those systems... But it's hard to grasp that. I know Sam and Z were kind of like it was okay, I think. I think Z Z's pretty excited about it. Sam was sort of where I am, I think, uh, in, in saying it's odd. and Yeah, well, Z likes those odder trick-taking games. Yeah. It's kind of weird for me. I like an odd trick-taking game, but it needs to have some sort of really oof yeah. to it. Yeah. I don't know. So, anyway, while we were here at the Portal Game Store, we did a couple things um, we did a top 10 list, which you can see online. And after the top 10 list, we took some questions from the audience. So let's uh, listen to those now. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Vassal, Mr. Vassal, Mr. Vassal, Mr. Vassal. Tom. any truth to the rumor that nothing personal is just a reskin of Click Clack Lumberjack? Why are you so mean to your co-host? All right, best food, Origins or Gen Con. And now Tom, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, have... definitely, Vassal, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Uh, 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 Tom, uh, uh, which way to the bathroom? All right, so does anybody here have any questions? We will take... Z has promised he'll answer anything. <laughs> anything? Amen. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have seen your essential games and gateway games, but I have an older group of... Plus women that are new to gaming and want to get into games. Uh, so keeping in mind theme for older women, you know, Memoir 44 is not going to work. It could. Uh, <laughs> uh, what would be uh, some good games? All right. So the question is, and we're repeating the questions for the purposes of the recorder. Um, question is, if for a group of newer gamers that are 65 plus young women, um, what would we recommend taking out Memoir 44? So that's Sam, that was your pat answer, so you're going to have to... No, <laughs> no we'll take, we'll, we won't talk about Memoir 44. I have to be very cautious in, in situations like this because I don't want to ever assume things about people. I've always been surprised to meet people and thought, oh, well, I thought you would like a specific type of game. Sure, right. I, I have found that Older people often like trick-taking games, so I often recommend like David and Goliath, or, or even Hanabi might work. Yeah, I think um, it's all. I mean, it, it kind of comes from 
gauging their interests first, mm -hmm. where I would start, as opposed to trying to figure out what someone who is 50 and from, uh, you know, Grenada and has, <laughs> you know, I, I can't, I don't know. I have no idea. But asking them what kind of games they like and trick-taking could be something that they have shared past in, right? They've, they've maybe all played a trick-taking game of one point or another, so it's a good point of entry. Um, maybe something that can deal with things that are common to most people like money management, which is something I often use when I'm teaching games to someone that does not play anything. I'll, I'll harken back to a game that plays with money, where money is the winning condition and you gather it and spend it because it just makes sense to people. You know, it's not abstracted pretty much in any way. We want more money and you have to spend it and having the most, you win. So things like that would be my suggestions. I think it's good to go, you know, one step further from, uh, you know, a classic game that more people are familiar with. Uh, say, take Scrabble and do it with symbols. So Quirkle or, right. um, you know, uh, Can't Stop. My, my mom actually runs a, a, a board game group at the local library for generally this demographic. And uh, the two I just mentioned have worked out very well for them. Uh, but I think finding some element of familiarity and then going one step further into the designer realm is probably the way to go. Two that came to mind were, for me was um, the 10 Days in series mm. um, from Out of the Box. Um, I think they're, they're still doing it, right? No. Well, well, out of the Box, out of the box is out of, out of the box is out, yeah. But they're was, still around, those games. That I would get them quickly. Right, yeah. Uh, the 10 Days in series, really any of them, um, because there's a... You know, the idea of traveling is something that everybody can kind of latch on to. Um, another one that kind of came to mind was uh, Transamerica. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a train game, but it's very, a very simplistic uh, train game where you're just putting uh, blocks of wood out on, to, uh, out on the board. And you can use other people's routes, so it's not like Ticket to Ride in that, that respect, where you have your own route. You can use any branch, and you just have to connect to the network that's already there. Um, so that, it's, it's a little bit of a... Hmm. N not as steep of a learning curve than, than uh, that uh, Ticket to Ride has. So I, 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 would, I would try to probably go with one of those two. Yes, sir. Well, kind of two, two questions. Uh, first of all, how large is your group that you usually play with now where you live at? The question is, how long is the group? How large? How large? I'm six foot four. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, he's asking you. Well, you too. Go ahead. Okay. Well, our group half of whom is sitting in the back of the auditorium. <laughs> really? Um, it, we're, we're about uh, eight to ten people right now. All right, we, we really fluctuate. Yep. Um, we, we meet on Tuesday nights and on Saturdays, and then um, sometimes on Thursday nights. On Thursday nights, we run around 20. Tuesday nights can go from 12 to 40. Yeah. And it's really, who knows? Now, Saturdays are bigger. We run 50 to 100. Yeah. Uh, 50 is a really low Saturday. Right. Um, that's once a month, though. And I deliberately run those once a month because I found that if you run something every week, if I miss a week, I'm like, meh, I'll go next week. But if it's once a month and you miss it, you're like, oh, man, mm -hmm. I'll, make, I'll go out of my way. And it's, it's more fun that way. And both of these are at a local store, right? You're, you're not meeting at somebody's house. That, that, was my, that was my next question was, are you meeting in an individual's house? Yeah. The house meetings are secret. You'll never find out about that <laughs> unless you're on the list, okay. which is actually partially true because I just don't have a very big house. So I can only invite a few people over at a time. Uh, I do have a big house. It's just I've already filled it with, with castles. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a game people, store, though. 20, game stores. Not very people show up at your house. Right. Well, actually, I would gladly have 20, 30 people at my house, but I live in a housing community. And ah, it's impossible. They hate mm. people in general. <laughs> <laughs> so getting just Sam and Z to come, yeah. we sometimes sneak. Like when we have meetups, I'll be like, all right, how many people can we carpool? Yeah. Because <laughs> we're trying not to irritate the, the homeowner association. So you try to support your local game stores then? Yeah. By meeting? Uh, oh, a, co a local game store, one of them is cool stuff, so yes. <laughs> okay, yes. I, I will support the local game store if I believe they deserve to be supported. And I've always stood by a flash. People say, you need to support your local game store. They need to deserve me supporting them. I'm not going to support them because they exist. We had a local game store that we stopped supporting because they did not deserve it. 
they no longer exist and it's not, I don't think, because of us. But, and I don't feel bad about that at all. I go to a local game store because it's the easiest. If I could find like a library or somewhere else to go play games at, I would consider it. You know, I, over the current local game store that we're at, possibly. Hmm. Am I going too far? Yeah. <laughs> Things will change <laughs> in the future. Whereas I meet at, at the gentleman's house, and so we just have a limiting factor of space. You know, there's yeah. only so many people yeah. that can fit in. So you guys always meet at the same person's house? We do. Wow. Yep, and he's been doing it for... What's the address? What's the address? <laughs> How many years? Like 14, 15 years. Wow. Yeah. How many years have you been gone? 10, 12, 13. Are you in founder member territory yet? I'm, I'm working on it. I, 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 like another three weeks and I get my badge. Oh. <laughs> Gotta learn that secret handshake. You're not there yet, but you got like another year to go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, on that same vein, for the, the one you've been going to at one person's house forever, uh, how do you reciprocate that generosity? We bring lots of snacks. The, the question is, how do we reciprocate that? Um, we, we bring food, uh, we bring games, um, we try and be as respectful to his house as possible um, because it is, it's a big sacrifice to, to be the host for that amount of time. Um, I, I like to think he enjoys it. Um, he and, shook and his head no for those listening. Yeah, I know. This is, he's looking at me like, uh, but yes. Um, this is, keep asking these questions because this is really fun for us. I think we try and be as respectful of his home, his space as we can. We'd like to continue. It, it's nice to be able to go to the same place, not to worry about who's hosting this week um, because it, it's a, it is a burden. Um, and and we, we try and be as respectful of that as possible. Are you the guy with the sword? I am not the guy with the sword. <laughs> I leave the sword at home. Here's the thing, though. I will say that even though hosting can be burdensome, there also is some benefits. When you host, sure. you can kind of control how it goes, too. You can say, this is the night we're doing it on. Why? Because it's my house. This is when we're done. Why? Because I said leave. Yeah. I mean, and then not... when you're done, you don't have to drive anywhere. You right. just go home. You turn off convenient. the lights. and yeah. This is the food we're eating, how? Because I hid the rest in a secret fridge. <laughs> exactly. Yes, sir. And when you have these meetups, especially like on the Saturdays or whatever, what time frame do you usually put on those? All right, so the question is, what's the time frame on meetups that we have? For our Saturday meetups, we run them from 11 a.m. till 9 p.m. They used to run them later, um, but we found, and there's always, every time we run any kind of meetup, I always have three or four people from my group come and say, why can't we run it to 1 or 2 in the morning? I promise I would stay. And they would, but there's five of them. So I always tell them they could all go to someone's house afterwards and those five people and play. But most people are done at nine. It really is the way it is. A special event, yes. We've done special events till midnight and, mm -hmm. you know, like even here, I think tonight's at midnight and stuff. That's like a special thing. But we found that as we are slowly getting older, we don't have that desire to game till one or two in the morning any longer. Um, and I would actually start at seven in the morning. Mm. Yeah. But I would be playing Z's list of top ten solitaire games for the first three hours. You'd finally get good at Oneira. Right? Seven o'clock in the morning. I would do it. He's awake like at six a.m. Actually, day. no, that's absolutely true. There have been conventions that I'll get up around that time too, because you know, just normally that's what we I'm do. And I go down, and we end up. That's when we play games together. Yeah, I come down and like, oh, it's Eric hey, and uh, the guy from uh, Japan who's visiting because he's his time <laughs> he's on the clock is wrong off. time zone. <laughs> we yep. three people are playing. Yep. <laughs> yes, ma'am. My favorite games to play with my children are always changing because they are changing. Um, right now, it's probably, what's the vile one? Uh, Dr. Eureka. Dr. Eureka. Dr. Eureka. Although I just played one called Top That, which is also from Blue Orange hmm. and was very fun. It's a, a bunch of hats and a rabbit and then you flip a card over and it says, this one must be hidden. This one must not even be in the group. And then you got to quick stack them so that some of them are hidden and stuff. And I really like that. That's a lot of fun. I, I like any game where we can have be equal, and that's really hard to find. There's not many games you know, either. Um, dexterity game where I'm like, my fingers feel like cinder blocks, and they're like, look, I just pulled that out. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> or it's you know a strategy game, but it depends what you get. Now, Melody, I can play any game in my library against. Except trick taking, she just cannot get trick taking. Hmm. But hmm. anyone else? I think we've we've exhausted the rules. Right? What's your favorite game? Uh, 
What is your favorite game and why is it Flux? <laughs> that's, big, that's funny. So the question is, why don't you like Flux? Don't hide the truth. Eric? <laughs> I, I like Flux. I we, do like Flux. Well, we know. Um, Otherwise, I've been lying in Looney Labs exactly. for a long time. It, every time. We have a new Flux. Oh, that, that goes to our dedicated Flux reviewer. He's the, that's the, actually the only dedicated whatever reviewer we have. No, actually, no, we have a dedicated heavy war game reviewer now. Rob. Mm. It's not you, Sam. Yes, it is. Yeah, Rob. Yes. He was like, oh. Yeah. No, well. you're also the dedicated Games Workshop reviewer. Yes, I am. And you're the dedicated, we don't know what this game is. I don't know what country Z? this is from. <laughs> Z, Z, figure it out. <laughs> but uh, Flux is one of the first games that got me into designer gaming. Uh, I, I still I enjoy it for what it is. It's it's light. It's quick. It can it's not always quick. It though. can go into terrible territory. But I usually go with like a thirty minute. If we we've been playing for thirty minutes and it's cycled around through the deck, okay, let's move on. Like but the, that's rare. I like the board game better actually because it gives you that same kind of feel and it's a little bit. It's still not great, but it's better than. I, I like trying to manipulate the system. You know, th th it is chaos, but. Maybe if I get to draw more cards, then I'll be able to use these in the way that I want. What can I do on my turn using those constraints to actually make progress? What's the best Flux uh, version? One of the pop culture ones that you Powerful are connected girls. with. So yeah, or, or, um, Monty really Python a, Flux really or Firefly Flux. Flux. Right? There is a Cartoon Network Flux that has the, the Powerpuff Girls in it, yeah. So find, find one of the pop culture ones that, that has some sort of connection to that franchise. It's the franchise. first time I've heard the word best and flux used in this <laughs> series. Oh, well, the flux capacitor is one of the best it things. It is a, science an excellent fiction. flux. That, that oh, works, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. That works. Okay. Any last questions before we shut down? Yes. Sir. So I really like the game uh, Twilight Struggle. Um, I think it's a really fun game, but it kills me to play it because the investment is just so high. Emotionally and mentally, it's ridiculously hard to play. Um, and my friends hate me for it because I'm the one that has a copy of the game. Um, so do you guys have any games like that that you consider really, really fun, but you just can't play them? It's hard to play. All right, so the question is, what are games that we really enjoy, we have them, but they're hard to play for emotional and... Well, they're taxing. Twilight yeah. Imperium 3 falls into that category because of the time investment alone. Um, it's not really an emotional or really, um, emotionally taxing or, or <laughs> that might be just you and that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for Sam, nothing is emotionally taxing, right? That's right. I'm I'm a stone. Arr, arr, arr. But I mean, I uh, TI three definitely falls in that category because it is hard to get to the table. I actually had the um, the Kindle version of that, and I'm at 105 to one. Wait, the Kindle version the Kindle of version Twilight Struggle? Yeah. 105 to one. Yep. And guess what? I won once. You've won once? Yep. Oh, oh, oh. So you've well, lost. I thought you, you lost one five times. Time. <laughs> For me, the game I have the hardest time getting at is, is HeroScape. Because as much as I, I mean, I really love the game, but I got bins of it now in the garage, so I have to go hunt them out. We take a while to build the map and get it out of all the figures. Yeah. And then when we're done, I can't be like, we'll just push it to the side. And we got to take it all down. I like it, but that, that long take up, take down time. Firefly, the game, it's on a lesser extent, but. Uh, you look at those cards that tell you how long the game goes, and you're like, lies. Yeah, oh, those, yeah, those are lies. <laughs> yeah, but for the most part, this is one of the biggest problems in game manufacturing. They yeah. all lie. Right. Yeah. Just, I don't know. For me, I guess it's just something that would be longer than I have the time for. I, I, those games tend to cycle their way out of my collection. If I can't play it, <laughs> it I'm, I'm getting rid of it. You know. But Fear of Dracula 3rd Edition especially, which is amazing, I really like, but it's two and a half, three hours, three and a half maybe. So that's not that's not long. It's just long for me to bring a couple of buddies over and sit down for a game. I'm not down for a three-hour one game session. You know, he just he's, he he does not amateur. include you as a buddy. First of all, because he wouldn't. I know. Right? No, not work colleagues. <laughs> oh, friends. Oh, work acquaintances. Right. So you had a question? Which way is the bathroom? <laughs> that way. Through oh, that yeah. door. Uh, I, adding to the, uh, the, the answer, I, I think I'd probably pick something that's in that three to four hour range. Uh, the, the heavier, uh, heavy economic engines that I, I enjoy, but I'm not always in the mood to tackle. 
um, through the ages might fall into that category. I got to be in the right mindset to be ready to grapple with that one. Or something that's really difficult to teach, even if it's short. Like uh, Race for the Galaxy mm. oftentimes stays on the shelf when it could come out because I don't want to teach it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Last one in the back. Yeah. Uh, quick question with the, um, the rise in new games coming out over the last few years and the size of the game collection is growing. With all the new games so many of us play, and you especially, how do you get back to older games you like? Hmm. All right, the question is, with all the new games that we're constantly playing, how do we get back the old games to the table? We kind of have a... Usually the games we know how to play, those are the ones we do for live playthroughs. That's one tactic that we've used, but even still, those are few and far between because <coughs> somebody doesn't like doing them. Um, uh, I won't say who. <laughs> we're in blue hat. <laughs> um, but... Uh, so, yeah, it, it, you have to actually make a conscious effort to do it because, I mean, you literally would not ever have to play an old game again, the number of games that we get for review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we literally could, could do that, I right. think. We yeah. could never not play it. For, I think it's... Which is kind of sad, yeah. I think, because there's a lot of games that are really good that I would really like to play, but sometimes you just can't get to them, but you just have to make time. For me, it's, it's usually ahead. an anger issue. It's after I play like two or three games that are just awful. Oh, right. Yeah. I'll be like this horrible, horrible. Yeah. And then I look at the next game, and that might be awful. So I say, all right, I'm going to go get a game I know is great. Because yeah. <laughs> we just have to have a palate cleanser here. Yep. Um, and that's, that's what I do. And if I ever look at my shelves and see a game, and I'm like, you know, I've never bought the table for a couple years, then it's out. Because then I, that's not as good as I thought at that point. And I guess for me, I just I find it important to keep people around that kind of keep you honest, for lack of a better term. People that that remember the game's just supposed to be fun, even if it's a stupid game, they can have fun, and that don't want to learn a new game. And it reminds you that if you're someone who learns new games all the time, you are not the norm. And that's a good reminder every now and then. Mm -hmm. Be like, listen, this isn't typical. Most people who own games at all don't own 600 and play the same one more than four times ever, right? So, you know, playing with someone that isn't a huge gamer will remind you to, oh, well, you like this one, right? Yeah, let's bring that out again. Yeah. We've, we've talked about uh, what, what my group does with the pick list. Uh, where everybody, yeah, yeah, we'd somehow. probably bring it up at some point. Um, that, that everybody gets a turn picking what they're going to play. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I obviously have this drive to get new stuff to the table, and the new shiny has such a, a draw. And, and I even managed to convince some of my group members to pick things when it's their turn oh, wait, that needs on. to get to the this table. Is, can you do that? But uh, what, Mind control, I'm telling you. He just, he just <laughs> talked about how he loves manipulating but, systems. Excellent. Um, but... Also, when when uh, it's it's somebody else's turn, they'll often bring something <laughs> because they're sick of the new stuff, and bring out an old favorite. And I go, oh yeah, I liked that one. That's a good one. And and so it's it's good to let other people have a turn and and uh, and get something to the table that hasn't hit in a while. We even did something uh, a few years back, highlighting unloved games, looking at. Um, what, go, ones that hadn't, you look at the shelf and go, whoa, whoa we hadn't gotten that, and just saying, all right, this is the first pick of the night. This is the game that we're going to play first. That's a good idea. Cycle them through. How do you get rid of a bad game? Fire. <laughs> 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 now, uh, with uh, the games, we have a cycle in, cycle out system at my house. It's, it actually is pretty interesting because we have um, five shelves of games at this point now that are yeah. to be played. <laughs> now, they're not, they're not full. We, we've actually uh, spread them out. They're okay. pretty close. Let's pretend that there, there's a lot. <laughs> actually, close. we're doing pretty good right now. There's times like in a month after S, and it's going to be sad. Because <laughs> we're going to go down there and go, oh. But I still have the picture on my phone of all of the Essen games and a pile taller than you and then another pile taller than you. Yeah, next that was, yes. But, so, but what happens is after we're done playing them, uh, someone will take them. If, someone, if one of us three or, or Derek, my video guy, if, we, if someone likes it, they get it, and the order is me, and then you guys can fight. Um, <laughs> but since I keep so very few games, it's usually not a problem, right? I got a lot of older games, so some of them are not good. 
Well, so then what I do to get rid of the games is we send them down and they're boxed up. And we take them all to the Dice Tower Convention and we get rid of them in a big mess. Flea and market. people come and flea market and get of them. However, if I wasn't doing that, I would try to foist them off of my game group because I'm the one making these guys play all these really, really bad games. And I'd be like, this game was awful. I'm sorry to make you play it. Do you want it? <laughs> <laughs> and you would be surprised how many people hate the game and they'll go, yes. <laughs> Gamers cannot pass up free stuff. Right. But there's also Board Game Geek, eBay. I just, I personally don't like dealing with that because the whole shipping thing is anathema to me. Mm. I hate going to post office. I hate dealing with all that nonsense. But that is a way you can do it. Or you, if, if you're more uh, filled with ramp, philanthropic, nice, you can give them to the library, to the, the thrift stores, to, you know, to, there's a, if you just put on Board Game Geek, I don't know what to do with my games, you will have people ask. I get emails all the time and someone goes, I know that you're going to say no. So I type no right away in the response <laughs> and they say, you know, can you send me this game? And I usually say no because it's a lot of work for me. But there's always people willing to take those games. But I think we're going to have to end this one here because we should probably play games today. Otherwise, this whole event is really weird. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. I Thanks appreciate everybody. it. Thanks, everybody. It's not often we have questions with a theme. <laughs> they were like all following up on each other. You it know? was. There was. It was like a press conference. Right, right, right. Um, so before we go, this is going to be a shorter show, by the way, folks. Um, before we jump into things, I want to talk about a new game that has just been announced. I couldn't talk about it for mm. a while. And that game is called Mechs and Minions from Riot Games. Okay. Uh, Mechs and Minions. Now, as a caveat to people who care, Riot Games flew me out last year. I think it was like last May. Okay. Um, as a consultant on the game. Hmm. And they showed me this game. I felt kind of bad because people, you know, Riot Games contacted me. And I was like, I don't know who you guys are. <laughs> Apparently they make League League of Legends, which is a very okay. which is the most popular computer game in the world. Wow! So yeah. now I know. Okay. And I knew that when I went out there because they have more employees working for them than like, I think all the board game <laughs> industry combined. <laughs> They're different industries, yes. So uh, they are very big board gamers, though. When they first brought me in, I really expected the game to be, you know, a board game designed by computer game people, which yeah. in the past has not been that great. But the game was pretty solid, and I made a few. I'm, well, I, I shouldn't say a few. I made a whole lot of suggestions. I <laughs> can't remember what they took and what they didn't take. Um, but just keep that in mind. The game is a cooperative game based on League of Legends. It's not League of Legends, though. You, it uses the same characters, these little characters that are in these mechs. And in this game, you're going through scenarios. Each scenario comes in an envelope. You open it up. There's mm -hmm. new stuff for the scenarios, some new cards. But it's not legacy. Legacy, because you... If you want to just open everything up, you can. Okay. There's no stickers or right, anything right. on it. So you, what you do is you have these mechs, and you have to accomplish a goal. Maybe that goal is to move a, a bomb from one spot to another spot, or maybe that goal is to just keep um, minions from destroying you. Because the game comes with piles of minions, mm. and these minions are going to move in pre-programmed ways, and you are moving in programmed ways. So what this game, the way that the main focus game, and I really like this, is it uses program movement, kind of like Rumble Rally and such. Mm -hmm. And in front of you, you have a track where you put these cards, and each turn you're going to flip over cards, and each player is going to draft a card, and then you add it to this track, and then you run your whole track. Okay. So I might pick a card that says turn one, 180, uh, move forward two, shoot someone within three space of you, and I put those in an order, and I run through that line. Hmm. So each round, your line is changing. You can sometimes rearrange your line. If you take damage from a minion, they'll put bad cards in your line. But what I really like about the line is the, there's, the cards have four suits. And if you put a card on top of another card, it, like, buffs it up. Hmm. So, like, there's a speed card that says move one to two. But if I put that on level two, it's move three to four. Okay. If I put on level three, it's move five to six. I might have one that says kill one minion within one space. I leveled up two minions, three minions. So you're feeling pretty buff after a while. Yeah. And each of the mechs has special abilities. And it is a 45-minute to an hour cooperative game. Super solid. Wow. Now, all this on the fact that the game is unbelievably produced. Huh. Um, it's a giant box. Of, it's like almost the size of the old Descent like the coffin uh, box? The coffin box from oh, Fantasy wow. Flight, and it's full. They uh, got, um, I don't know if you saw the company that was making the custom plastic inserts that were molded to the pieces. No. And they got that company to make it. So the whole thing, every inch of this box is full. There is at huh. least 
80 to 100 of these little minions. The four mechs for the characters are a couple inches high and are fully painted. Wow. There's The cards are high quality. Everything, I mean, the board, it's it's it looks like $150 games and it costs 75 Wow. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I mean, they're selling it only directly from their website. Okay. So that's how they're keeping the cost down. It's 75 plus shipping, but still. Right. Yeah. Oh, I probably. mean, well, if you go buy a $75 from Fantasy Flight, it doesn't look anything like this. Right. So this game, I know some people are going to go, oh, it's miniatures. Yeah. Other people are going to be like, oh, miniatures. <laughs> but even if you don't like, I think, for example, I think you would really like it. Okay. It's not an Amerithrash game. It's just, you know, hey, we need to program. You're working together. Huh. It has a timer in it, which I like. The way the timer works is... You put out uh, one more card than the number of players when you're drafting, mm-hmm. and then you start the timer. And then each player drafts a card, but if that timer runs out, then you hand out the rest of the cards randomly. Okay. Once you get the card, you can take your time figuring out where what slot to put it in on your line. Yeah. But the reason you have that timer is no one can alpha game then. They can't tell everyone what card to take because we don't have time for that. Hmm. And so you have these quick discussions. Okay, I really want that card. And yeah. so I was like, um, oh, okay, that's fine. And, you know, you had some quick back and forth on what cards, but you don't have time to look at everyone else's thing. You're looking at your own thing yeah. and saying, okay, I need this card. I This is not only one of my favorite games of the year, it's one of my favorite games ever. Wow. I was that impressed wow, wow, with wow. it. Um, my only negative, I guess, would be the box is really big. <laughs> um, but the pieces are, it's, it, it looks like a deluxe Kickstarter edition of something. Okay. I have zero problems with the components, and the gameplay is fast. There are 10 scenarios in the box, I think. And I really like how each of the mechs eventually goes on its own mm-hmm. divergent path. You get these cards that are special abilities, and you can only pick two of them. Hmm. Um, yeah, this is going to be a big game changer, I think, to okay. some degree. I mean, I don't think Riot Games is going to be producing hundreds of games. Right. Maybe a game every year or two, but... I was expecting, like I said, a computer game company making a yeah. board game. I just expected it to be huh. that. But they, they have a board game group in their company that's bigger than most board game groups in the country. <laughs> so they really okay. like board games. So yeah. I was very, very impressed with this. That's mechs and minions. So one of the questions we get asked on our show all the time is, how do you run your live Wits and Wagers event? How do we run our live Wits and Wagers event? Well, we did mention it in one of our episodes. We went we through did, it, right? We talked about it, but but here we decided let's let's record it and see what it sounds like. Right. So you're going to hear, I don't know how much of it we're going to play. I don't know. Um, how much, it depends how tired Eric is when he edits this. <laughs> uh, but we're going to play some of it for you just so you can hear kind of how a Wits and Wagers thing goes. Now, realize we were moving mics around. We were in a small room. Yeah, yeah. So it's very possible that... People in the room could hear us, and you can't. You know, right. we'll do our best, but here we go. All right, we're going to get started here. <laughs> Welcome to the first Wits and Wagers for Connecticut, I think, that we've run. Sure, yeah. Have you run, <laughs> have you run any? Just in my own house. Does that count? Are you doing this in your own house? Yeah. You, don't you can do this at game. home. You don't just play, you actually run the show? I run the show. Good. I just pretend all of you are in my living room. <laughs> all right, so who here has never played Wits and Wagers before? All right, that is not a problem at all. Yeah, anybody can play this. We're going to explain the rules now. Wits and Wagers, we're going to ask you questions in Wits and Wagers in which the, it's a numerical answer. It might be a percentage. It might be... Um, a date, but it's a number answer. It's an answer that I think most of you don't know. There's a chance someone knows it, but likely you don't know. Some people may have an idea of maybe the answer, but you probably don't know it. So we're going to ask this question, and then each team will write the answer down on their board. Uh, They will then send a person calmly (laughs) up here to the front, where you will turn your boards into Mr. Z Garcia, who's running the board up here. He will then uh, rearrange these boards and put them in order from smallest to largest. And Sam Healy will also be writing the answers here on the board. Your team then is going to come send a person up and you're going to bet on each answer. Now each team has two betting chips. May I see yours please? You do not need to bring anything else other than both of these. You can bet on two different answers if you want with these. And each one will give you the odds that it lists up here, which is 5 to 1, 4 to 1, 3 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1. So if you put this on the 4 to 1, you'll get this back along with three more chips. Is that right, Eric? Am I doing math right? That sounds right. 
Yes, it's wise. Um, but you can also bet money on with these too. When I say money, I mean these poker chips. And when I say these poker chips, I mean our poker chips, not yours. So we get these back when we're done. But when you put poker chips underneath, if you're wrong, you'll lose them. But if you're right, you can get even more. Now, the good news with these, uh, these chips and when you get these poker chips is you'll get them back and you can use them to bet. But the winning answer is the one that's closest to the number without going over it. We also will always have an answer that is all answers too high. So if you guess too, if, if you think you know that everyone's just crazy, you can always bet on that. And I would say once every game that happens, maybe? Usually. Usually. <laughs> That's two different people. When you use the mic, you're like a different person. Um, what else am I missing here, Eric? Uh, I think you've got it. Oh, no, yeah, I, OK. We're grown-ups. We're not Magic the Gathering players. <laughs> oh, they can't hear me. That's not good. OK. okay. No, but listen, we're grown-ups. If I see someone's phone out, we're going to have to take it. OK, come on now. Don't be looking up the answers on the internet. Come on now. This is not, this is, again, small prizes, small stakes. And as, if there's anything I know on the internet, people do not go to extremes over small stakes. Is Pokemon OK to play? Is there a stop in here? Yes. Yes. Uh -oh. Wait, what? <laughs> uh, we've lost Eric. <laughs> so what we're going to do here is the best way to teach a game is, of course, to show a game. So we're going to run through a sample question. You will get nothing from this question. You will get no money, no points. All right. Here is your test question. In the event of an actual question, it would sound something like this. <laughs> In the United States, how many people die each year of falling out of bed? In the United States, how many people die each year falling out of bed? You have 60 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, they're all in. Super I like counting. <laughs> so here are the answers. Whoa. <laughs> Projecting is yes. sometimes bad. Okay, so the answers are how many people die falling out of bed in the U.S.? We're going from the lowest, and that is 42 teams said that. Oh, that's backwards? Sure, why not? Um, next up, 58. Next up, 154. Two teams at 200 people, 445, and then 5,387. I feel like they know something. <laughs> That's a real specific number. You said 5,387. Right here. All right. We want we want you to own that. All right. All right. Set someone up. Make your bets. Now you're coming up with those two chips. Place them on the one you think Don't is right. Don't bring any extra chips. For and no, no money for just for this one. No money. Just your two regular betting chips this round. Remember, this is a practice question. Are all bets in? All bets are in. Now one more. There's that all in because <laughs> there's always a chance if you're the last bet in that it doesn't count. Just saying for really slow people. Um, if you are the correct answer, you will also get 10 points for that. So 10 bucks or whatever we're calling them. By the way, whites are one, reds are five, greens are 25, and blacks are 100, but you don't need to know that. You'll never get them. Chaz says make them 20. Hmm? I said Chaz says make them 20. Chaz is completely incorrect on that. <laughs> All right, what do we got? And the answer is 450. Oh! So in this case, orange would have gotten 10, and orange and yellow would have gotten uh, several more for having bet on that. All right, come get your boards, your chips. All right, Eric, what is the first real question? The first real question is as follows. The Adams Family first appeared as cartoons in The New Yorker in what year? The Adams Family first appeared as cartoons in The New Yorker in what year? Your 60 seconds begin now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 
four, three, two, one. All answers in, please. Since we're playing with eight teams and the board has seven spots, if there is an odd number, whoever has written the highest number will be not in that round. <laughs> yes. What? If there's eight different answers, we take the highest answer. It falls off the edge. And it falls off the edge. <laughs> that sounds mean and arbitrary. 1931, 1932, 1939, 1947, 1948, 1952, and 1955. Two teams said 1952. All bets in your 60 seconds begin now. This is real money. Well, I mean, as real as it gets. 10, 9, Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. <laughs> the Adams Family premiered in 1938. That is uh, yellow. Yellow had the closest answer. Overshot by one year. All right, here's your ten bucks for being correct. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Who forgot their little marker thingies? <laughs> uh, purple and green, Eric. Purple and green, you say? Question number two of our seven question extravaganza, plus or minus bonus questions, is, as of 2015, how many films have been based on Stephen King stories? As of 2015, how many films have been based on Stephen King's story? Your 60 seconds begins now. Okay, good. I'm glad we asked this question. Um, our Wits and Wagers policy is, first of all, we're always right, regardless of what you find on Wikipedia later. Secondly, sometimes I can't clarify it because I don't care. And with the TV movies, I don't know, so I'm going to pretend to look wise. I don't believe it includes TV movies. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All answers in. The answers are 10, 13, 14, 17, 19, 28, and 34. 30. Place your bets, please. Has he even written that many books? He wrote 34 books last month. <laughs> Stephen King we're talking about. Just, just tell me if they're all in already, so I don't have to keep counting. Oh, it is, it is. You love to count, Gary. I love counting. 15 seconds remain. Ah, ah, ah. Eight, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The answer is 36. Oh. All right, great team. Nice. Okay, folks, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a bonus question here. Bonus question. And for each, we're going to have you write down your own answers and check your own answers because we trust you that much. <laughs> All right? We're going to talk about the question we just asked, which was Stephen King's movies. And we want to know, we're going to give you... Two minutes. Two minutes to write down 10 answers only. You cannot write more than 10. And we want to know what the top 10 grossing movies based on Stephen King books, what they are. Um, it's not adjusted for inflation. So it's based on when they came out. And what are those top 10 movies? Give them two minutes. Write them on your card. Write small. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time's up. Pencils down. Wow. No, you keep them. We'll let you check your own. Are you ready? In the number 10 slot is Harry at $33 million. In the number nine slot, Carrie, the 2013 version, at $35 million. I didn't write the question. Come on now. You're right, I'm a jerk. Number eight is The Running Man at $38 million. 
at number seven, The Shining at 44 million. Number six, Secret Window at 48 million. Number five, Stand By Me, $52 million. Number four, Pet Cemetery, $57 million. Number three, Misery, $61 million. Number two, 1408, $71 million. And number one, The Green Mile at $136 million. Shawshank Redemption is number 14, did not make that much money in the theaters. Deservedly so! You shut up! One good actor does not a good movie make. Hey, can you give out tips? Well, I hope that was entertaining. Yeah, yeah, well, it, here's the deal. Even if it doesn't sound entertaining, it, it, it usually is in person. Yeah. We usually have fun, and you it's its always interesting for us when we play What's the Wagers. People come in, and they're very hesitant if they're new. Right. And we say, sit at a table, and they're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. It'll be fine. But once we start, yeah. you, these tables like all huddle together, especially those bonus questions. Um, the What's and Wagers guys introduced the bonus question yeah. in one of their games, and then we upped it to two. And now I finally have to oh, no, three, three because they are literally, we found, I think, they're the most fun thing that people do. Yeah. Because we try to ask questions that at least people have some sort of knowledge on. Like, you may not know much about baseball, but you probably know some you know of the teams. Some of the names of the teams, yeah. Uh, you, you, everyone has, you, know, you might not eat at McDonald's, you know, but you probably know what's on the menu. Or right. even Stephen King, you may have heard of the movie. I, so I try to, and I try to pick different categories. And so right. it was a... It's just entertaining. It doesn't yeah. even matter who wins, really. Because almost always, like in this game, we had, what, three or four teams that got zero. And it always happens. But they have fun. I mean, everyone goes for it in the end. and, and uh... Not everyone. The one team didn't go for it and right. had the other team not nailed it. One team right. one put team all got, their got chips big... on, on one answer, and they were correct. But had uh, they not done that, the team that had held their chips back would have won. Yes. And that happens sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think we've ever had a Wits and Wagers event that hasn't been successful. Um that, that we know of. That we know of. Maybe we, maybe there's a lot of grumbling somewhere, but yeah, uh, it, it was it was a blast. And this has been fun. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good one. We we still have about uh, let's see what time is it ten. So we have about five or six hours left. Like you said, we're playing our games. I'll I'll play Cosmic and other games. You're going to play just yours. I, I will be playing Merchant for a little while. Yes. So if you uh, met us at the convention, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we want to thank the portal guys for bringing us in. It was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, let's see. Next week, I guess we go back to normal, but yeah. well, Essen's coming. Essen is on the horizon, enough. yeah. So, anyway, thanks for listening, everyone. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 476, was recorded on September 16th and 17th, 2016. Coming up next week, it's our top 10 real time games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has turned your game upside down, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me, with assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Searing. Margarita Salt provided by Ono Rim. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Boards and Swords, Flip the Table, On Board Games, The Game Pit, The Party Game Cast, Board Games Insider, and Board Game University. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. So what's the oddest place you've had somebody sign an autograph? Oh, the oddest place? On their arm? No, <laughs> I think no, I think I did sign someone's did you arm, do an arm once. Arm is the farthest I okay. would, I would <laughs> That's go. That's it. After Be, that, you Below the elbow. There you go. <laughs>